hematopoiesis, how the body regulates hematopoiesis. And we are going to be talking about anemia, mainly about the definition, classification of anemia. You have to know that there are more than 200 types of anemia. Okay, we are not going to study all of them. We are going to focus on some of them, the most frequent ones. And we are going to study uh, how we classify, anem uh, classify anemia depending on the size of the cells, depending on the content in hemoglobin of the cells. Um, so we're going to focus on pernicious anemia, megaloblastic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, sideroblastic anemia, the thalassemias, different causes of aplastic anemia, hemolytic anemia, and also something that is called anemia of chronic inflammation or anemia of chronic disease. Okay, here we have um, the normal composition of the blood, something that in certain way we have to master. Okay, I'm talking uh, now about the percentages, for example, <laughs> in the leukocyte differential, because this is, this is going to be the first clue in our diagnostic process when we order a CBC with the differential. So we know if the patient has uh, increased number or proportion of neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, etc. Okay, you already know that 55% of the blood is uh, the plasma. Is this liquid that contains <coughs> proteins, water, and other solutes? In the proteins, we have albumin, which is very important in maintaining the os uh, colloidal osmotic pressure or oncotic pressure of the blood. So keeping the fluids inside the circulation. Then we have the globulins. There are alpha, beta, and gamma globulins. You already know very well the gamma globulins because these are the antibodies. Then we have fibrinogen, prothrombin, and some other clotting factors in different proportions. Ions, nutrients, waste products, gases, oxygen, CO2, and some enzymes or regulatory substances. And of course, all of the toxins and things that we can have the leukocytes make less than 1% of the blood, and the platelets also less than 1% of the formed uh, part of the blood, formed elements. There you have the different types of leukocytes. Notice that neutrophils represent up to 70% of the leukocytes, okay, uh, leu uh, lymphocytes up to 25%, and then we have smaller percentages of monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Okay, any increase in the proportion <coughs> of neutrophils, any increase is going to be called neutrophilia, any decrease is going to be called neutropenia, the lymphocytes the same, lymphocytosis or, or lymphopenia, depending on if these cells are increased or decreased. And 99% of the formed elements of the blood are the erythrocytes, which normally are in charge of transporting respiratory gases as you already have studied, because of these uh, special characteristics that they have, that they get rid of the organelles and they only contain hemoglobin, which is a protein that has a very high affinity for these respiratory gases and transports them to the different places. Okay, there you have the cells, okay, the structure, the normal amount, and their function. <coughs> and also you have the lifespan of these cells. Hey, um, many of these things have been studied before okay, when you studied anatomy and physiology. So there is surely nothing new for you in this uh, in this slide. Okay, maybe you want to review very well the functions of these cells. Okay, for example, remember that the neutrophils participate in the early phase of inflammation. And normally when people have a, an increased number of neutrophils within this person has an acute bacterial <coughs> infection. Um, lymphocytes normally appear in chronic infections and in acute viral infections. Also the function of the uh, eosinophils that protect against parasitic uh, parasites and also participate in allergic reactions. So review the functions of these cells Okay, also the lifespan is important. Okay, notice that, for example, lymphocytes can last for decades. Okay, some lymphocytes 
last for some days only. Okay. They, for example, the cytotoxic cells, they are activated, they go to the places uh, where the infection is taking place, and they can die as a result of this uh, battle against infection. But the helper cells, they can live for decades. They can be activated when we are very young, and they can be alive and working during all of our life. Okay, some cells have a very short lifespan, like the neutrophils. They live for about four days. They go, fight infections, and they die in this process. Okay, er erythrocytes can last up to 120 days. And we're going to be learning about the functions about, and about the importance of some of the precursors of the cells, mm -hmm. like, for example, the reticulocytes, which are immature erythrocytes that normally will represent a very small proportion of the total amount of erythrocytes in the circulation. And we're going to see what represents if they are decreased or they are increased in number. This is something that is going to be very important for the diagnosis, for differential diagnosis of different types of anemia. Also, about the shape of the cells, it's important to know what cells are segmented polymorphonuclear cells, okay, for example, the eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils, they are segmented cells. And this is because of the shape of the nucleus. It's not a round nucleus, like, for example, the monocytes or the lymphocytes. They have nuclei with more than one lobe, in times two lobes, four lobes, eight lobes, depending on the cell, depending on the stage of the cells. Notice that the lymphocytes, monocytes, they are mononuclear cells. Okay, so these differences are important to later understand the pathogenesis of the different diseases of the blood. Yes? Uh, and like the neutrophil also like uh, polymorphic? Polymorphonuclear cells. Yeah, segmented cells or polymorphonuclear cells. They are called that, that way. Well, here we have hematopoiesis. Okay, notice uh, that the body has different organs that are able to perform hematopoiesis, not only the bone marrow. But depending on the <coughs> stage of development of the body, different organs are going to be able to perform hematopoiesis and at different ages, some organs are going to stop making blood cells, but if necessary, they're going to start <laughs> producing blood again. Okay, there is a fit or an embryonic structure that is called the jug sac. That is the first organ that starts making our blood cells for the embryo. Okay, this organ starts uh, declining its function okay, during the first months of the embryonic life, and the liver and the spleen start taking over this function. These are the first fetal hematopoietic organs. Notice how, most importantly, the liver is the one that takes the hematopoietic function during the first five months of our life, and also the spleen. After the four or five months of the fetal life is when the bone marrow starts taking the function. Okay, The liver and the spleen don't produce too much blood after the five months of the fetal life. And it's the bone marrow, the one that takes over. Different bones, the bone marrow of different bones, the vertebrae, the pelvis, the sternum, the ribs, okay, the tibia, are going to start producing blood cells okay, at birth. And with age, only the vertebrae, the pelvis, the sternum, and the ribs are going to be producing blood cells. Other organs are going to stop producing blood cells. For example, the tibia, the femur, are going to stop or produce very little amount of blood cells. Most important are the vertebrae and the pelvis, then the sternum, and then the ribs in the production of blood cells. But you have to know that if there is any problem with the erythropoiesis in these organs, if the bone marrow, for some reason, infiltration or aplastic anemia or any other problem, uh, stops producing blood cells, the liver and the spleen are going to take over and are going to start producing blood cells again. That's why in some cases you're going to find splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, because these organs are now making blood cells besides of their normal functions. 
This is the uh, process of development of the blood cells in the bone marrow. Notice that I put a note here. You don't have to memorize all of these. This is impossible. I'm sure nobody knows this in detail, except, except people who really work in this uh, hematology. And you don't have to memorize this, but you have to understand certain concepts and be able to localize certain cells depending on if they are blasts, if they are sites, understand what is a band and what is a reticulocyte. Those four are very important things. Okay? Notice that the process of cell development starts with a stem cell that is a, that is a multipotent hematopoietic stem, cells, stem cell that can take depending on certain stimuli, different lines of development. Okay, they can become a common lymphoid progenitor, lymphoid, or can become a common myeloid progenitor. Okay, very important to distinguish these two branches, the lymphoid and the myeloid. This is gonna be very important to understand later the leukemias. You're gonna study lymphocytic leukemias and myelocytic leukemias. So you have to know that this classification depends on what branch of these cells is the one that is affected and is producing the cancer. So we have a common lymphoid progenitor that will give origin to the lymphoblast. Okay, there we have one of the first blasts. Blast, remember, means immature cells. You study the osteoblasts, that give origin to the osteocytes, which are the mature cells of the bone. Here we have the same. The lymphoblast is the precursor of the lymphocytes, which are the mature cells. And then you know that there are different types of lymphocytes. You have the B cells, you have the T cells, you have the natural killer cells, okay, that come from that line, in the lymphoid line. The lymphoid line is very simple. Okay, lymphoid progenitor, lymphoblast, and lymphocytes. Now, the myeloid line is a bit more complicated. We have this common myeloid progenitor that will give origin to a very high number of cells. Several blasts, like the megakaryoblast, that is the one that will give origin to the megakaryocytes and to the platelets. Then we have the proerythroblast, that is an immature red cell with a nucleus that will give origin to a cell that is called the reticulocyte, which is another precursor of the red blood cells that can be found in the circulation in a very small proportion, remember, up to 2%. And this is the one that will give origin to the erythrocytes. Okay? Also, the mast cells come from here. But one very important line is the uh, from the, these myeloblasts is the line that gives origin to all of these granulocytes. Okay, so we have a, a very high number of precursors here. Okay, basophil promyelocyte, neutrophil promyelocyte, eosinophil promyelocyte. Also, the monocytes come from here. But notice that we don't have any blast here in these uh, granulocytes, okay, the precursor that we have to remember of these basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils are the bands. Okay? Basophilic band, neutrophilic band, eosinophilic band are the immediate precursors of the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils. Because you're going to be studying different books and different clinical cases and you're going to see that the patients have an increase in the number of bands, and you need to know what that is and what that represents. Or the patient has an increased number of reticulocytes in the circulation, and you need to know what that is and what that represents, clinically speaking. Okay, in this myeloid line, also, we have the monoblast that gives origin to the monocytes, that later, you know, become macrophages when go to the tissues and do their phagocytosis. Okay, so when studying this, please make sure you have clear what cells come from the different lines. The lymphoid is very easy. Lymphoid line, lymphoblast, lymphocyte. 
that is very easy. The other one is the one that is a, a little bit more, more complicated, from where we have the platelets, red blood cells, basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. Okay, I repeat, the bands are the precursors for the granulocytes, the reticulocytes are the precursors for the red blood cells. Looks complicated, is complicated, but we can make, try to make it as simple as possible. Erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis uh, is a process that is normally stimulated by hormone that is erythropoietin. Normally, erythropoietin is produced by the kidney when there is a decrease in the number of red blood cells decreased hemoglobin synthesis, decreased blood flow, hemorrhage, increased consumption of oxygen to the tissues that will lead to hypoxemic conditions in the kidney. Okay, the kidneys, uh, when they feel that there is low oxygenation, are going to produce EPO, which is erythropoietin. Erythropoietin will stimulate the bone marrow. The bone marrow will increase the production of these red blood cells precursors erythroblast, reticulocytes, and then erythrocytes, increasing the number of red blood cells in the circulation. Okay, and these red blood cells, when they increase, they are going to fix the conditions, increasing the oxygenation in the kidneys, producing a negative feedback at the level of the kidneys, reducing the production of erythropoietin. Okay, exactly the same negative feedback that you studied when you uh, were reviewing, for example, <coughs> endocrinology, the regulation of the hormones is what occurs here. Okay, we have a stimulus that is hypoxemia, increased hormone, hormone acts on the bone marrow, bone marrow increases the production of red blood cells, this increases the oxygenation and stops the production of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, there is a synthetic uh, chemical that we make that can be used to treat anemia in some patients. So anemia, um, anemia is a big concept, okay, and the most important thing about anemia is finding the cause of anemia. When someone has anemia, one of the temptations that we have is to simply prescribe iron. Okay, you have to do this, you have to eat better, you have to eat more meat, you have to eat this food that is rich in iron, and you have to take these pills, make sure that you don't take antacids with the pills, you don't take meal, you try to take the pills with orange juice, which is very good. But what is the cause of the anemia? That is the most important thing. Okay? Anemia means that there is a reduction in the number of erythrocytes or a decrease in the quality or quantity of the hemoglobin that leads to a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Okay? And that is the most accurate concept of anemia. Any reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is considered anemia. How do we know that a patient has anemia? Well, we make a blood test and we determine that there is a reduction in the amount of hemoglobin or in the number of red blood cells or hematocrit of this patient. And we say the patient has anemia. Anemia can result from decreased production of erythrocytes. So the bone marrow is producing a little amount of erythrocytes. Or we are losing erythrocytes, for example, people can have an acute bleeding after an accident or surgery, or chronic bleeding. Some people have chronic gastrointestinal bleeding. In women, it's very common, the anemia, because of heavy menses, okay? Also, anemia can occur because there is an increased destruction of the erythrocytes, something that we call hemolytic anemia. Okay, and, this is, and the labor of the clinician is to determine what is producing the anemia. Is the patient bleeding? Is the bone marrow having issues in making blood? Or the body is destroying the blood that is made? Okay, and that's why we make some blood tests. And we have to be uh, very skilled in interpreting them. Okay, some patients have anemia because of a combination of these factors, as we are going to study. Anemias can be classified in different ways. For example, uh, by what, it, what is causing the anemia. 
for example, anemia of chronic disease is uh, one of the types of anemia. But the most common classification is by the changes that affect the size of the cells, the shape of the cells, or the content of hemoglobin of the cell. Okay, normally the terms that we use to identify the anemias reflect these characteristics, the size, the shape, and the hemoglobin content. Okay, we are going to see that, for example, anemias are classified, uh, we are going to see later the classification. The terms that end in CITIC, okay, refer to the cell size, macrocytic, microcytic, or normocytic, depending on the size of the cell. And the terms that end in chromic refer to the color or to the content of hemoglobin of the cell. Okay, so we are going to have normochromic when the content of hemoglobin is normal, or hypochromic when the content is low. Also, there are some other terms that describe the shape of the erythrocytes or the sizes. For example, anisocytosis means that there are cells found with various sizes. Some are small, some are normal, some are big. Or poikilocytosis, when they have different shapes. Okay, you are going to uh, see, for example, in the blood smear, see that the cells have different shapes or different sizes. Say, so, well, I find macrocytosis, anisocytosis, poikilocytosis, depending on the findings. You are going to have the opportunity here um, in the clinical laboratory lab of watching some slides of real patients, and you're gonna see some examples of these uh, findings. Also, you're gonna know how to recognize different white blood cells, okay, because of the size of the cell, because of the shape of the nucleus, and you're gonna learn how to count the cells, how we do a complete blood count, manually counting these cells. Something that surely you're not gonna have to do in the future, and I in mind that can be boring, being eight hours counting cells <laughs> in a lab. Hmm. Well, this is a blood test. Uh, this is the CBC. Mm -hmm. Here we have the different parameters that are going to help us. Okay, for example, we have the red blood cell count, normal values in men and in women, hematocrit, and hemoglobin. First, different values for men and women. Well, these uh, values, the number of red blood cells, the hematocrit, and the hemoglobin, are going to serve us to know if someone has anemia or not. <coughs> okay? Any decrease in the number of red blood cells, any decrease in the hematocrit, and any decrease in the amount of hemoglobin is going to represent what we call anemia. Okay, there's going to be a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. We have to be very careful. For example, when someone has an acute bleeding, when someone just had a car accident and is taken to the hospital 10 minutes after the car accident and you draw blood from this patient, everything is going to be normal. Okay, if you do the hematocrit, it's simply centrifugating the blood and separating the red blood cells from the liquid part. It's going to be normal immediately after the acute bleeding. Now, if you wait some hours, some days after that, okay, is when you're going to find the anemia. Okay, because in that moment, the proportion of red blood cells to plasma is totally normal. Okay, so then we have some other values here. Mean corpuscular hemoglobin, uh, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. These two values are going to help us to know if the anemia is um, normochromic or hypochromic. Okay? This MCH and MCHC, if someone has less than 27 picograms or 32%, we say that the, person, the patient has a low amount of hemoglobin. Okay? They tell us the color, okay? the chromatic characteristic of the red blood cells. So this is what, gonna, what is going to help us to say that the patient has a hypochromic anemia or a normochromic anemia. And then we have something that is the mean corpuscular volume, that is the size of the red blood cell. Okay, so if a patient has cells 
with a mean corpuscular volume below 79, these are microcytic anemias, small red blood cells. And if the patient has an, a mean corpuscular volume above 100 femtoliters, the patient has a macro, big, macrocytic anemia. So big red blood cells. Then we have the white blood cell count that tells us if the patient might have an infection or not. Okay, leukocytosis, leukopenia, depending on the values. And then we have the differential to guide us to see if the patient has an allergic process or if the patient has a bacterial or viral infection. And the platelets that will tell us about the coagulation of the blood. Okay, and will make us very careful with this patient. Um, for example, if you have a patient with a very low platelet count, you don't want to give aspirin or ibuprofen to these patients because they can bleed. And we don't want that. So we're going to be studying these anemias one by one. But I try to put them in this um, slide so you have them in the big classification according to the size and the shape of the cells. On top, you have the macrocytic normochromic anemias. That means they have a mean corpuscular volume that is above 100. But all of these values are normal. The content of hemoglobin of these erythrocytes is normal. Okay, there are large abnormally shaped erythrocytes, but have normal hemoglobin concentrations. We are going to study two types in this uh, group. We are going to study the pernicious anemia, which is a disease that occurs because of lack of vitamin B12, not because of uh, dietary deficiency, but because the body is not making intrinsic factor, which is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12. Normally, this, can be, this, this can be congenital, but in most cases, it's an acquired process. The body develops antibodies against the parietal cells or against intrinsic factor, so we don't have enough of this intrinsic factor to absorb B12. And then we have the megaloblastic anemias that can be due to folate or B12 deficiency in the diet, okay? which produces a premature cell death. Okay, the cells don't have folate and don't have vitamin B12 to make DNA. So it's impossible for the cells that are constantly dividing uh, to grow. Many, many cells die by apoptosis, and the ones that remain alive grow a lot to try to compensate. That's why we have these big cells, but in small number. We're going to study the difference clinically of folate and B12 deficiency. Then we have another group in which we have microcytic, so small cells. Let's go back here, less than 79 femtoliters, and hypochromic, so low content of hemoglobin, anemias. Okay, we have small, abnormally shaped erythrocytes with reduced hemoglobin concentration. Examples of microcytic hypochromic anemias we have iron deficiency anemia, sideroblastic anemia, and thalassemias. We're going to study the, them in detail later. Okay, lack of iron to make hemoglobin is the cause of iron deficiency anemia. This can be produced because of dietary deficiency. This can be produced as a result of chronic blood loss. Sideroblastic anemia is a problem with the metabolism um, of the erythroblasts, okay, they normally have a problem that they can't use the iron because of lack of certain metabolic factors. And thalassemia, which is a problem with the synthesis of the globin chain of hemoglobin. Okay, let me show you a picture of hemoglobin for you to understand something. This is hemoglobin. Okay, hemoglobin is formed by four subunits of protein, which are globin chains, to alpha and to beta chains, that contain something that is called a heme group that normally is the one that has the iron bound to it. Okay, so any problem 
with the production of this heme group or with the addition of the iron or with the production of these globin chains will lead to defective erythrocytes. It's impossible to make erythrocytes if the bone marrow doesn't have the means and the tools and the material to make all of these components. Okay, so there you have that you can have problem with the iron for hemoglobin, problems to make the heme group or to incorporate the iron into this uh, heme group, or problems in the synthesis of the proteins alpha or beta chains of hemoglobin. These things are going to produce a microcytic hypochromic anemia. And lastly, we have the normocytic normochromic. This means they are going to have a normal size and normal amount of hemoglobin, the red blood cells, in the blood smear. But we are going to have low number of erythrocytes. For example, insufficient production something that we call aplastic anemia. We are going to study it later in detail. The stem cell proliferation is low, so the bone marrow produces low amount of cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. We have a post-hemorrhagic anemia, acute blood loss. Pay attention that we have blood loss in two places. The acute blood loss is here, normocytic, normochromic, and the chronic blood loss is here. Okay, microcytic hypochromic. So chronic blood loss, acute blood loss will be here. Then we have uh, hemolytic anemia, in which there is a premature destruction of the erythrocytes that are circulating. So either no production or early destruction of the erythrocytes or loss of the erythrocytes is going to produce this anemia. And also, we are going to study here in this group sickle cell anemia, in which the problem is making hemoglobin. These cells are going to have an abnormal shape when they are under certain, con certain conditions like oxidative stress and hypoxemia. And also, in this group, we have anemia of chronic inflammation. Okay, that appears when people have any chronic infection, chronic inflammatory process, or malignancies. We are going to see that this disease looks like iron deficiency anemia clinically, but we are going to know how some blood tests are going to allow <coughs> us to differentiate when someone has anemia of chronic <coughs> infection or iron deficiency anemia. Uh, there are many things many things very interesting about this anemia of chronic inflammation. How the body protects the iron reserves so they are not available for bacteria, but at the same time is preventing the formation of new red blood cells. Anemia, um, well, anemia is very interesting. But the problem with anemia is that all the patients look alike. Okay? Paleness, sometimes a little jaundice. There is shortness of breath with exertion. There is fatigue. Okay, so clinically, it is very difficult. There is nothing in the physical exam in most patients that you can use to say, oh, this patient has this. Like in other diseases, for example, respiratory diseases with auscultation and history etc., um, you can have a diagnosis, very likely. But with anemia, it's very complicated. We actually need to see the cells by using a blood smear, and we need to count the cells to, by using a complete blood count. And sometimes do other tests, like genetic tests or protein electrophoresis, to see what, which of these proteins are increased or decreased. Okay, so, Notice that the signs and symptoms of anemia can be from mild to moderate or sometimes severe, depending on the patient. Typically, we find shortness of breath or fatigue upon exercise. Okay? In severe anemia, there can be even fatigue and shortness of breath um, at rest. People are going to have paler. It's a very common and universal finding in anemia. This occurs because of a compensatory shunt. The body 
shuts down the blood vessels that go to the skin to maintain the blood in the vital organs. That's why they, they, uh, they seem pale, shunting of blood away from the skin. In some patients, we can find a systolic flow murmur. Notice that when people have anemia, the blood is thinner than normal. There is a lower proportion of red blood cells to plasma. Okay, so this blood is going to tend to circulate faster. And this fast circulation of the blood through the heart is going to create turbulence in some patients with severe anemia. Okay, so they are going to have a systolic murmur that can radiate to the neck. And in cases of hemolytic anemia, these patients can have splenomegaly, sometimes hepatomegaly, and jaundice. We're going to see that the excessive destruction of the red blood cell cells is going to make a lot of, uh, produce a situation in which there is a lot of free hemoglobin in the blood, okay? And this uh, excess of hemoglobin will be uh, converted into bilirubin. There's not going to be time for the liver to process all of this bilirubin. So this bilirubin is going to accumulate under the skin and mucous membranes. So they are going to present with jaundice. So these are common findings for anemias. We're going to see what types of anemias are more likely to have something or less likely to have other findings. We have here the pathogenesis of anemia and the compensatory mechanisms that the body uses. Okay, we start here with the mechanisms that produce anemia. We have either a decrease in production of blood cells, or we have blood loss, or we have increased destruction, the three main mechanisms that lead to anemia. This will, any of these three mechanisms will lead to a reduction in the number of red blood cells or hemoglobin concentration. Reduction of these cells or hemoglobin will lead to a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood leading to hypoxemia in different places. Okay? There is a lower content of, of oxygen in the blood. There is less oxygen getting into the tissues. It's called tissue hypoxia. That can lead to ischemia in different organs. For example, it can produce claudication in the muscles. So tiredness, weakness after walking certain time, fatigue, paler on the skin and mucous membranes increase respiratory rate. We have lo less amount of cells, so I'm going to increase the respiratory rate to provide more oxygen to the blood, so I can uh, provide oxygen to different organs. Hypoxia in the central nervous system will produce dizziness, will produce fainting and lethargy, depending on the degree of hypoxia. And also in the liver, there can be fatty changes that can occur also in the heart or in the kidney. Notice that these here are the manifestations of all of the types of anemia, the clinical manifestations that you're going to find in many patients, depending on the severity, depending on the degree, and depending on the duration of this an anemia. Then we have the compensatory mechanisms. Okay, there you have some cardiovascular mechanisms. For example, in the, at the same time that we increase the respiratory rate, the heart is going to increase the heart rate because it needs to send more blood. Remember, the content of oxygen is less, so the heart has to beat faster in order to send more blood, for example, to the kidneys and to the brain. But this increases the oxygen demand of the heart. The heart is working more and receiving less oxygen. So this is going to produce angina, for example. Okay, An increase in the oxygen demand of the heart is going to lead to an increase in the erythropoietin by the kidneys that will stimulate the bone marrow to increase the blood cell production. Increase heart rate, this will produce an increase in the systolic volume. Remember, you increase the systolic volume with a blood that is thinner than normal, that has higher content of plasma than normal. This will lead to what is called a hyperdynamic circulation that can produce some cardiac murmurs. Remember the systolic flow murmur that we were talking before. And sometimes in, a severe, in severe cases to a situation that is called high output cardiac failure. 
Normally, the patients with heart failure will have a low cardiac output. In the cases of anemia, they can have a high output cardiac failure. What else can happen as a result of the compensatory mechanisms? The kidneys will increase the renin-aldosterone response, increasing the retention of salt and water. This will add more fluid to the extracellular fluid and to the blood, increasing the problem with this high output or hyperdynamic circulation, murmurs and heart failure that can occur in severe cases of anemia. And also there will be an increase in biphosphoglycerate in the cells because of the hypoxemia that will decrease the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, increasing the release of oxygen from hemoglobin into the tissues. Okay, different things that will occur in anemia directly as a result of tissue hypoxia, hypoxia and as a result of the compensatory mechanisms. And there you have all of the clinical presentation, claudication, weakness, fatigue, failure, increased respiratory rate, dizziness, fainting, cardiac murmurs, high output heart failure, increased red blood cell production as a compensatory mechanism, fatty liver, increased fat in the heart and in the kidney, increased extracellular fluid, increased heart rate, increased stroke volume. Okay. So this is a very good uh, diagram that shows all of the progression, all of the pathogenesis, and all of the clinical findings of patients with anemia, and the relationship between them. Well, we're gonna start with the macrocytic normochromic anemias. Okay, remember, we go back here, In this group, we're going to study pernicious anemia, megaloblastic anemia, that can be due to folate or B12, or B12 deficiency. Okay, these are the ones that produce macrocytic anemias. They are characterized by having what we call megaloblasts, which are large stem cells in the marrow. Okay, normally, these uh, large stem cells mature into, into erythrocytes that are large in size and have a normal content of hemoglobin. Okay, these diseases normally have a problem with the production of DNA. You're going to see that B12, vitamin B12, and folic acid are necessary for the production of DNA. Okay, so these cells, the stem cells, cannot make DNA. Remember, to make another stem cell, you need to replicate the DNA of one cell. If you don't have enough B12 and folate, the cell that you're making is not going to have good DNA, so it's going to die by apoptosis. But the production of RNA is OK. So the cell that, is, that has normal DNA is going to produce lots and lots and lots of hemoglobin, which is the protein that they are making. So this, they are going to have low number of cells, but they are large in number and have a normal or sometimes higher than normal content of um, hemoglobin. Okay, this results from ineffective erythrocyte DNA synthesis because they don't have the necessary factors, cobalamin or folate. The defective erythrocytes suffer apoptosis early. This decreases their number in the circulation. <coughs> this is anemia. And the surviving ones are larger than normal, macrocytic anemia. There are many things that can produce macrocytosis, not only B12 or folate deficiency. <coughs> For example, chemotherapy can produce uh, <coughs> macrocytosis. Pregnancy increases the consumption of B12 and folic acid. So if pregnant women don't take enough supplements of these vitamins, they can develop um, macrocytic anemia, megaloblastic anemia, and also can have certain problems with the fetus, like neural tube problems, like spina bifida or so, some other congenital malformations. Intestinal tapeworm can also produce megaloblastic anemia because this tapeworm is consuming all of the B12 that we are taking with the diet. 
and drugs, not dogs, drugs. <laughs> Methotrexate, phenytoin are just examples of drugs. Okay? In fact, any several drugs are, are in the list of the drugs that produce megaloblastic anemia. Drugs. Well, here we have a two tables, um, more exhaustive, okay, of the causes of folate and B12 deficiency. But we are going to go over them after the break. Okay, let's have a 10 minutes break. Okay, um, here we have tables that tell us about the causes of folate and B12 deficiencies. Okay, these tables um, are something that you have to look carefully without memorizing them, it's not necessary, because from there is from where people take, for example, the start of a vignette, the type of patient that you are going to have. Because when someone has anemia, and you make a blood smear, and you find macrocytic cells, it can be either B12 or folic acid. Okay, sometimes people present with neuropathy, and this can serve to say, oh, this is mo most likely B12. But it could also, could also be neuropathy of other causes. For example, thiamine deficiency also produces neuropathy. And folate deficiency tends to go together with thiamine deficiency, so you are not very sure. Okay, so you have to use the causes sometimes in order to determine if your patient has B12 or folic acid deficiency. In the clinical practice, you are going to make a blood test to determine the levels of B12 or folate in the blood. But in the test, you can do that. So you are going to look, for example, for nutritional deficiency. In boards, they normally use, for example, alcoholic patients, okay, or people who overcook the food. They take vegetables, for example, but they boil the vegetables during one hour <laughs> to make sure that all of the bacteria are dead. Mm -hmm. They don't take raw vegetables, so they are destroying the folic acid and the bacteria. Okay, so alcoholism, people with poor dietary intake, people with certain disorders like depression, people living in nursing homes, etc. Also people with malabsorption, okay, people taking certain drugs that uh, interfere with the metabolism of folate, methotrexate, trimetoprene, phenytoin, alcohol again. And some situations in which there is an increased demand of the body for folic acid, like pregnancy, lactation, okay, exfoliative, Foliated dermatitis, psoriasis, any situation in which we lose a lot of the skin, we have to make more cells, so we have to um, use more folic acid. Okay, notice that, for example, we have storage of folate for three months only. So the symptoms of folate deficiency are more likely to appear before the symptoms of B12 deficiency. But okay, someone can have a deficiency of both. But the symptoms that first appear are those related with folate deficiency. Because we have up to one year of reserves of B12 in the body. What are the causes of B12 deficiency? Well, we're going to study these autoimmune disease that uh, attacks intrinsic factor and the parietal cells. Okay, so pernicious anemia is one of the most common causes. Then we have anything that affects the stomach. For example, a chronic atrophic gastritis, chronic gastritis, gastritis gastrectomy because of a gastric cancer, for example. A surgery, for example, a gastric bypass, bariatric surgery. Then we have also malabsorption of different types, okay? Different types of malabsorption. We have this tapeworm that we mentioned before that consumes a lot of B12 of the diet pancreatic insufficiency that will lead to malabsorption. Now, vitamin B12 is only found in meat, in animal origin food. Okay, so people who are strict vegans, 
are likely to develop B12 deficiency if they don't take supplements. Now, if the, if the question says the patient is a vegan since two months ago, you're not likely to develop any kind of B12 deficiency, okay? Because remember, we have stories for one year of these B12 deficiency. Now, some drugs that block the absorption of B12, neomycin, metformin, proton pump inhibitors, okay, H2 blockers, are uh, also in the, 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 the classic patient of uh, B12 deficiency will be a patient with chronic gastritis that is taking omeprazole. Okay, the, patient, the classic patient that appears in boards will be uh, chronic gastritis or gastrectomy that is taking omeprazole. These are uh, foods that are rich in folate. That is that there are several, all of them are vegetables. Okay, normally they are dark green. There are other sources. And these are the sources of B12, okay, eggs, meat, oysters, poultry, milk. Okay, so I'm a strict vegetarian. You know that some vegetarians take eggs or milk, etc. And they don't, they should take supplements of B12. Well, we are going to study pernicious anemia. <coughs> Remember, this is an autoimmune disease, okay, in which people don't have an intrinsic factor. It's caused by B12 deficiency, normally associated with the end stage of chronic atrophic autoimmune gastritis, we develop antibodies against the parietal cells. Remember the parietal cell is the one that produces acid, the one that produces intrinsic factor. So they are going to have a low acidity in the stomach and they are going to have low amounts of intrinsic factor. Okay, the name pernicious comes from a word that means highly injurious or destructive. This condition was fatal several years ago. Normally it affects people between the ages of 40 to 70 who are of Northern European descent, but we are discovering that the prevalence is increasing in everybody. Okay, maybe it was prevalent in one type of people, but now everybody is mixed with everybody and everybody is doing the same and exposed to the same conditions. So these differences are going to disappear in the future. There are, for example, 10 to 20 cases per 100,000 people in individuals of Celtic or Scandinavian origin. <coughs> okay. This is the prevalence in this uh, ethnic group. It's lower in other people, but the prevalence is increasing. Well, there is absence of intrinsic factor that normally is required for the absorption of B12. If we eat meat, for example, Vitamin B12 will be bound to some amino acids in the meat and will require intrinsic factor to detach the B12 from these amino acids and then this complex B12 intrinsic factor is the one that will be absorbed in our intestine. If B12 is not present, vitamin B12 will go away. This can be congenital, very rare, but more often the most common cause is an immune attack against parietal cells. When you have a patient with pernicious anemia or any autoimmune disease, you have to look for other autoimmune diseases because they come in clusters, okay? It's frequently a component of an autoimmune polyendocrinopathy. For example, people can have, besides pernicious anemia, they can have thyroiditis, Hashimoto, for example. They can have type 1 diabetes, Addison disease, primary hypoparathyroidism, Graves disease, or myasthenia gravis. They can have one, two, three, or four of these conditions. Most cases are due to autoimmune gastritis, okay, destruction of the parietal cells. There are autoantibodies against the hydrogen potassium ATPase, remember the proton pump, or antibodies against the proton pump. The gastric mucosa gets atrophied, <coughs> okay, the parietal cells are destroyed, and this results in a defic deficient secretion of acid, pepsin, 
an intrinsic factor. Okay, so low acidity, the problems with the digestion of the proteins, and with the absorption of B2. Also, there can be antibodies against intrinsic factor, directly destroying intrinsic factor. Well, uh, some people um, propose that one of the events that can be involved in the pathogenesis of this chronic autoimmune gastritis is infection with Helicobacter pylori. Okay, so this can be secondary to a past infection. Someone gets infected with H. pylori, get a gastritis, they can develop certain uh, signs and symptoms. We detect the bacteria, we treat the bacteria, and eliminate the bacteria. Now, we develop antibodies against H. pylori. And in some cases, some proteins present in H. pylori can look very similar to the proton pump and can look very similar to intrinsic factor. So the antibodies now don't have H. pylori to fight, and they start looking for someone to attack. Okay, remember exactly what happened in rheumatic heart disease, when people after the infection with Streptococcus pyogenes, the antibodies start attacking the joints, attacking the heart, valves, etc. Here we have something similar, okay? Active infection with H. pylori is rare in individuals with pernicious anemia, but more than half of them possess antibodies against the microorganism, which suggests that these individuals had an infection with H. pylori. So the current opinion means that people who are genetically predisposed, and they have antibodies against H. pylori that mimic the proton pump in the parietal cells, will result in the antibodies binding to this protein and attracting inflammatory cells that will destroy this parietal cells. Of course, if we remove the stomach, we don't have more cells that produce intrinsic factor. So this is one of the causes. And proton pump inhibitors decrease the acidity of the stomach and decrease vitamin B12 absorption. Of course, they don't cause pernicious anemia, but they can cause uh, megaloblastic anemia because of lack of B12. So people who have the chronic gastritis plus they are taking proton pump inhibitors have more than enough reasons to have deficiency of B12. This condition develops very slowly, okay, over 20 to 30 years. So when we diagnose the condition, it's usually very severe, okay? The early symptoms can be very vague, non-specific. They can have certain infections, mood disorders, gastrointestinal si symptoms, cardiac or kidney disorders. Now, when the hemoglobin is very low, when it decreases to seven to eight grams per deciliter, is when they start having the classic symptoms of pernicious anemia, which are weakness, fatigue. Those are common to, common to all anemias. But then we'll start having some paresthesias in the feet and fingers, pointing to neuropathy, difficulty walking, because of weakness and lack of coordination and problems with the proprioception, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, weight loss, sore tongue, smooth and beefy red tongue, a yellow, uh, a lemon yellow skin, which is a combination of paler and jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly in the elderly, and even right heart failure. Remember, as a result of these uh, complication of anemia um, that produces this increase um, cardiac output heart failure. The neurologic manifestations appear from demyelination. Vitamin B12 is necessary not only to make DNA, also to make myelin. Okay, so there, these people are gonna have problems in the production of myelin. <coughs> they are gonna have the loss of position and vibration sense and ataxia and spasticity because of damage to the posterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord. Notice that these findings and or these changes are not reversible with treatment. Once this degeneration of the spinal cord occurs, there is nothing we can do. Maybe we can treat the anemia, we can make the bone marrow produce more blood cells, but the neural damage 
uh, is gonna have a, is not gonna be reversible. Also damage to the brain, loss of white matter in the brain will produce affective disorder, depression, okay? Low levels of B12 have been associated with neurocognitive disorders, okay? Increased prevalence of serum B12 deficiency has been reported among people with Alzheimer's disease. So we have to check the B12 in our patients once in a while, okay? <coughs> this is uh, the atrophic glossitis, okay, in a patient with pernicious anemia. Smooth surface on the periphery of the tongue <coughs> reflects the loss of papillae. This is showing how <coughs> there is a degeneration or for because of demyelination of the posterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord in a patient with pernicious anemia. Now, folate, uh, folate and B12, they present very similarly. Folate deficiency tends to have more manifestations in the mouth than nervous system manifestations, okay? Because folate is not necessary for the production of myelin, so they're not gonna have these problems, neurologic problems, unless there is another deficiency. Folate is required for production of DNA and RNA. Okay, and the, for the conversion of homocysteine to methionine, okay, our metabolism. The cells that divide rapidly, for example, those in the bone marrow, are going to be affected by lack of folate. Remember, we have very little amount of folate. So when people start having nutritional disorders, they are more likely to uh, suffer from folate deficiency than B12 deficiency. And we depend totally on the dietary intake of folate, <coughs> and of course, lactating and pregnant females require more. Normally, folate is absorbed from the upper small intestine and doesn't require any kind of intrinsic factor or nothing like that for absorption. Folate is stored in the liver, okay? Folate deficiency is more common than B12 deficiency, particularly in alcoholic individuals with malnourishment. 10% of North Americans are folate deficient. But now this incidence is decreasing because we are adding vitamins and supplements to many foods, so we are seeing less and less and less, at least in this country. The clinical manifestations are very similar to pernicious anemia, but they normally have the history of alcoholism, malnourishment, or taking certain drugs, phenytoin, sulfonamides, or methotrexate, that block the metabolism of folate and uh, reduce the amount of available folate. These people are gonna have more specific manifestations like calosis, which are scales and fissures in the corners of the mouth, stomatitis with ulcerations. They can have painful ulcers in the buccal mucosa and tongue. These manifestations are gonna be very similar to something that is called burning mouth syndrome that can occur as a result of extremely dry, dry mouth, infections, autoimmune diseases, and other nutritional deficiencies. There is a link for you to go to what is this burning mouth syndrome, which is one of the things that we have to rule out. Of course, in the clinical practice, you simply detect if the levels of folate are normal or low, okay, and you simply give a supplement of folate. They're gonna have also nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, dysphagia, flatulence, or watery diarrhea that can lead to weight loss. If someone has all of these digestive and abdominal complaints, of course, the appetite is gonna be very low, and this is gonna lead to weight loss. Some people can have inflammatory bowel disease, undiagnosed inflammatory bowel disease, that inhibits the absorption of folate Okay, so this is one of the things that we have to rule out when we have a patient with folate deficiency. Remember, a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia doesn't help the patient at all if we simply give iron. A diagnosis of folate deficiency doesn't help if we simply prescribe folate. 
why this patient has folate deficiency? Why this patient has iron deficiency? Because if I prescribe folate to a person, this person takes the folate for a couple of months, they're going to come six months later with the same problem if we don't fix the underlying problem, which is maybe the malabsorption, maybe it's the bad conditions in which the patients, patients live, or the alcoholism, or something else. Okay, so try to find the cause of the cause and the cause of the cause until you can fix the problem. Okay, I told you before that these patients don't have the neurologic manifestations because lack of folate alone doesn't produce any neurologic manifestations. But if they have concomitant thiamine B1 or cobalamin B12 deficiency, of course they are going to have the neurologic manifestations. And it's very common that people with folate deficiency have also thiamine deficiency. So thiamine deficiency is going to produce neurologic manifestations. If women don't take or don't have enough levels of folate, this can increase the risk of neural tube defects, like spina bifida. OK, this is most important during the first trimester of pregnancy the moment when the nervous system is at the more critical moment for the formation of the nervous system. There you have the calosis, there you have the smooth uh, beefy red tongue, there you have ulceration stomatitis. Okay, remember patients with B12 deficiency can also have these oral manifestations. Okay, these are very common to different vitamin deficiencies. Next we are going to study the microcytic hypochromic anemias. Okay. Remember this can appear because there is not enough iron, or there is a problem synthesizing the heme group, or there is a problem synthesizing the proteins of the hemoglobin, the globin chains. They are called iron deficiency anemia, sideroblastic anemia, or thalassemia. Different types of thalassemia that we are going to be studying here. This is the picture that I showed you before. This is the way hemoglobin is made. Okay, there are four chains of globin, two alpha and two beta chains. Okay, they have a heme group that is composed by this ring. There is a porphyrin that has attached one iron atom there. All of this is necessary for the hemoglobin to be able to catch oxygen. Okay. Iron deficiency anemia is the most common anemia everywhere. Why is the most common in people who live in poverty, women in childbearing age because of the menstruation, and in children? Okay, in children, it is very common, remember, uh, for the absorption of iron, we need an acidic environment in the stomach and small intestine for this iron to be absorbed. E one common mistake that some people make with their children is to prepare the food using milk. Okay, you, try, you buy the most expensive steak in the market, okay, you process the steak, and you mix it with milk, milk to make uh, the food of the babies. That is a very bad mistake because we are adding substances like calcium that inhibit the absorption of iron. Okay, when the intestine has to absorb, and there is iron and there is calcium, it's going to get the calcium. We're not going to get the iron because we need a lot of calcium for the bones of the babies. And iron we need, but not that much. Okay, so the intestine prefers calcium versus iron. So giving milk or giving ice cream or giving yogurt after the meals is one of the most common causes of anemia in children. And the only thing that you have to tell the patients is okay, you want to give a yogurt, wait two or three hours after the meals. Okay, give the meals with water or with orange juice or with something that doesn't increase the pH 
in the small intestine so the iron can be absorbed. And just by doing that, you can fix the problem with the anemia without having sometimes to give any medication. So iron deficiency in children is associated with cognitive impairment that may be irreversible. Okay? Females, of course, have a higher incidence than males because of the menstruation. Males have a higher incidence during childhood and adolescence than females after <coughs> the adolescence, after the puberty, females start having more incidence. In fact, when you see a male <coughs> with anemia, you never have a good thought about that. Okay? You see a 30, 40 year old man with anemia, this guy is bleeding somewhere, or this guy has something somewhere that is consuming everything. In women, we always think for seeing menstruation. Okay, in developing countries, remember parasitic infestations, iron loss, blood loss. If we treat the infections, the parasites, this will result, of course, in improved <coughs> appetite, growth, and less anemia. Iron deficiency anemia also has been observed in overweight children. Okay, the exact reason why they can have more anemia than children with normal weight is that maybe they are eating many things like sweets and soft drinks and foods that are very rich in carbohydrates and sugars. So when they have to eat, they don't eat. Okay? They're taking an ice cream, a cookie, a this and that, a soft drink, etc. And when they have the plate, I, I'm not hungry now. So they eat less uh, of the nutritious food than children who are normal weight. Well, we can have iron deficiency anemia either because we take too little iron, we don't absorb the iron, or we lose for a combination of these factors. Okay? Iron deficiency will first deplete the iron stores in the body and will reduce the hemoglobin synthesis. Okay, let's remember some proteins that we have in the body that are necessary in the metabolism of iron. Okay, we have ferritin. That is, necessary, that is the one that allows the storage of iron. <coughs> and then we have transferrin. That is the one that transports the iron. Transferring transports the iron. The other one is the one that stores the iron. We measure these proteins in the blood to determine what is the cause of the anemia of the patient. This is something that you are going to learn more of it in medicine. We are going to advance some details about the interpretation of the findings, okay? But it's important to start knowing what they mean. If you want to know how much iron has this patient in a storage, okay? They're gonna assess the amount of ferritin. If you want to know how much iron is in the process of transportation, you want to know what is the amount of transferrin, and you want to know if this transferrin is full with iron or is empty of iron, okay? If the transferrin is empty, okay, we say that the patient has an iron binding capacity that is elevated. Okay, one way we have to measure the transferrin indirectly is measuring the T I B C or total iron binding capacity. Okay, if the total iron binding capacity is high, that means that transferring is empty, doesn't have iron bound to it, so there is nothing in transportation. If the total iron binding capacity is low, that means that the transferring is bound to iron, and there is a lot of iron being transported from the spleen, for example, to the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. These are things that you're going to study in more detail in medicine. So iron deficiency leads to a depleted, uh, to depleted iron stores. Okay, so you're going to have 
low serum iron, low, low ferritin. The iron binding capacity is going to be very high because body is looking for iron to take to the bone marrow. The transfer ring will, will be empty looking for iron everywhere. There we have some causes, okay? For example, pregnancy, <coughs> blood loss are the more common causes in developed countries. If we lose two to four milliliters per day, that is enough to cause iron deficiency anemia because we don't have way to absorb more than one to two milligrams of iron per day. That is the maximum amount that the intestines can absorb. If we start losing more than two milligrams of iron per day, there is no way that we can replace the, the lost iron. Menorrhagia or excessive menstrual bleeding causes uh, iron deficiency anemia in females. And there are other causes that can appear in both males and females. And these are the ones that we have to look for in males. For example, bleeding from ulcers, hiatal hernia, esophageal varices, cirrhosis, hemorrhoids, ulcerative colitis, or cancer. Many people have hemorrhoids, for example, or um, anal fissures, and they bleed every day they go to the bathroom, and they don't say anything, because they are embarrassed, or they don't want to go to the proctologist, etc. And they are bleeding every day, and they don't say anything. Okay, and one day, if they are losing more than four milliliters of blood per day, and that is easy in someone with hemorrhoids, they are going to develop an anemia. So you have to look for this. Well, medications that increase the breathing. Yeah. Just curious, what is the body reserve for iron? What is the body reserve? Yeah. Well, right now, no. yeah. <laughs> what is the body reserve? But what do you mean, the, the actual well, storage? Yes. Yeah. The macrophage. Uh, the, uh, so you were asking me about a, a number. No. Macrophages are in the, in the spleen, in the liver. They are the ones who actually have the iron. Okay, normally, remember the red blood cells, when they uh, get to this age of 120 days, okay, they are destroyed in the spleen. They are phagocytosed by the macrophages there. These macrophages keep the iron, send the heme group to the liver in the form of bilirubin, okay, and destroy the globin to make amino acids to be used to make other proteins or to make more globin if it's necessary. But these macrophages in the liver, in the spleen, are the ones who have the iron bulb, or inside them. And they release the iron when it's necessary in the bone marrow. They have an exchange with the bone marrow. But we don't have, like for example, for folate, it's about three months. We don't have an idea, depending on the amount of blood loss, how long we have iron stored mm. for. Not exactly now. I don't. I couldn't tell you right now. For of course, it depends on the loss. Right. I mean, there should be a formula to calculate, mm -hmm. depending on the exact amount of blood. Okay, how much we are gonna be losing every day. Okay. So something that decreases the stomach acidity. Okay, for example, surgical procedures like gastric bypass. Okay, anything that. Uh, pro produces any problem in absorption, eating disorders, okay, eating non-nutritional substances like dirt, chalk, paper, etc. H. pylori infection also can impair the iron uptake. Many different things can lead to this iron deficiency anemia. And develops very slowly. Notice that there are stages, and this is what I don't have is the duration of these stages, and I think this is the question that you were asking. But there are three stages, okay? One, when the iron stores are depleted, there are no symptoms in this moment, the red cell production continues, okay? And the hemoglobin content of the cells remain normal, iron stores are depleted in that moment, then there are insufficient amount of iron transported to the marrow, and it's the moment when we have a, or initiate the production of deficient red cells. But the clinical symptoms start in the stage three, okay, when these hemoglobin deficient cells enter the circulation. Okay? Depleted iron storage. We have 
blood cells being produced in the marrow, but not going to the circulation, but they are start being produced with defects. And now we have these cells in the circulation, and it's when the symptoms start appearing. Okay. There are uh, the end of the circulation to replace the age erythrocytes that are destroyed, okay, and they appear all of the manifestations, shortness of breath, paleness, weakness, etc., appear when there is insufficient iron supply and decreased hemoglobin synthesis. The clinical manifestations, well, remember this is gradual, okay? And people normally don't seek medical attention until the hemoglobin is very low, seven to eight grams per deciliter. Okay, yeah, they're, they're gonna have the symptoms that are very common to all um, anemias, fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, <coughs> paleness in the earlobes, palms, conjunctiva, the things that we find in the physical exam. In a more severe case, when this disease progresses, the fingernails will become brittle and can be either spoon-shaped or concave, which is called uh, coilonychia. Also, they can have a tongue atrophy in the papillae. And this is uh, something that is very common to many nutritional disorders. Soreness in the tongue, redness, burning, one of the causes of mouth burning syn uh, syndrome. And the changes can be reversed within one to two weeks of iron replacement therapy. Okay, also, they can have angular stomatitis, the corners of the mouth. They can have dysphagia. Sometimes they can develop a <coughs> web in the opening of the esophagus, something that narrows the opening of the esophagus, so they can have dysphagia, coilonychia, concave, rich, and brittle nails, and glossitis. There's a lot of papillae. Now, there can be other uh, manifestations because iron is not only used to make hemoglobin. Okay, we also need iron so other enzymes in the body can work in different processes. Okay, so people can present with gastritis, neuromuscular changes, irritability, headache, numbness, tingling, and vasomotor disturbances. You don't find many gait disturbances in iron deficiency anemia. And in the elderly, you have to know that these uh, events, like memory loss, confusion, disorientation, uh, we see as normal, and we say this person has dementia, <coughs> this person has Alzheimer, is simply very old, can be as a result of iron deficiency. And sometimes giving iron to these patients can help relieve some of these symptoms. Of course, the ones that depend on iron, not the ones that are as a result of the normal aging. But at least they are gonna get a little bit better if we treat the iron deficiency. Sideroblastic anemia, I was looking for a picture and I didn't put the picture, I remember now. But what is this sideroblast? It's important to understand what is a sideroblast before studying sideroblastic anemia. Okay. This is a red cell okay, that has a nucleus, right? And has like a ring of iron around the nucleus. Okay, if you observe this in a blood smear, you say this is a sideroblast and this is a sideroblastic anemia. You notice like a ring of little dots. These are iron deposits there. So this disease is a group of disorders. Some of them are inherited, some of them are acquired. Okay, they present with anemia, mild, very severe. And what they have in common is the presence of sideroblasts in the bone marrow. Okay, so you can do a bone marrow aspirate, for example, 
and you're going to have these sideroblasts. What are these cells? Which these are erythroblasts, remember precursors of erythrocytes, that contain iron-laden mitochondria arranged in a circle around one-third or more of the nucleus. Okay, so all of these dots that you saw around the nucleus are the mitochondria that contain lots of iron, iron deposits around the nucleus. This simply is iron that hasn't been used to make hemoglobin. Remember, there is a problem in the production of the heme group, in the incorporation of this iron to the heme group, so the iron, instead of being used to make uh, hemoglobin, gets deposited in the mitochondria, and this mitochondria, of course, die and um, aggregate around the nucleus. These people also have increased tissue levels of iron. So iron can be deposited in several tissues of the body, under the skin, in the heart, in the liver, in several different uh, organs of the body. Well, the most common uh, sideroblastic anemias are the acquired ones. Okay, they can be idiopathic. People simply have this, and we don't find an explanation, or they can be associated with myeloma, polycythemia vera, and leukemias. Okay, we are going to study, when we study the cancers of the blood, we are going to study what they are, multiple myeloma, polycythemia vera, and leukemias. And this means that when you have a patient with sideroblastic anemia, you have to look for these conditions. Okay, you have to make uh, different tests okay, that will allow you to know if they have any kind of malignancy of the blood. There are also some reversible anemias, sideroblastic anemias, in people who are alcoholic, okay, as a result of drugs, copper deficiency, cases of hypothermia. Then you have the uh, drugs that can produce sideroblastic anemia, isoniazide, <coughs> pyrazinamide, cycloserine, and chloramphenicol. Okay, these can produce sideroblastic anemia, but remember they are reversible. The hereditary ones are very rare, and they, ex they, occur, uh, they, they occur in males exclusively. That uh, gives us that these uh, inherited conditions might have an X-linked inheritance pattern. When we study the malignancies of the blood, we are going to study the myelodysplastic disorder. Okay, even if you have never seen this name before. Okay, you have to be able to break down this name with the knowledge that you already have. Okay, remember when we were studying the hematopoiesis process, remember from the hematopoietic stem cell there are two lines, <coughs> okay, lymphoid and myeloid. The myeloid is the one that gives origin to red blood cells, platelets, and granulocytes and monocytes. Now you have here myeloid pointing to the myeloid line of the blood and dysplastic. I'm sure you remember what is a dysplasia, okay? So you put those together and you have a dysplasia of the myeloid cell lines in the bone marrow. Remember dysplasias can have different um, pro uh, prognosis. Some of them remain like a dysplasia forever, okay? And some of them develop into cancer. Okay, so when someone has a dysplasia in the bone marrow, they are at risk of developing a cancer. So it's a precancerous lesion. Myelodysplastic syndrome, that we're gonna study when we study malignancies, is one of the leading causes of acquired sideroblastic anemia. Okay? These patients will have abnormalities in all cell lineages. Of those who survive, 40% will develop acute Myeloblastic leukemia. Remember, leukemias can be lymphocytic if they affect the lymphoid line, or myelocytic if they affect the myeloid line. So they are at risk of developing an acute myeloblastic leukemia. So when you have a sideroblastic anemia, look for myeloma, look for myelodysplastia, <coughs> look for reversible causes, look for polycythemia vera, Look for all the conditions that you're learning here. That is your differential diagnosis. 
Okay. Clinical manifestation. Well, this is an anemia. We'll present with all of the characteristics findings of anemia. Anemias can be mild, can be moderate, can be severe. Okay. They, remember, will have all the manifestations of anemia, weakness, paleness, shortness of breath, etc. But remember that now they have a problem in the utilization of the iron. Iron doesn't get incorporated into hemoglobin, so gets deposited everywhere around the nucleus, forming the sideroblasts, and also can be deposited in other organs, something that we call hemochromatosis. Okay, the present will present with signs of iron overload, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Despite the presence of iron in the liver, the liver function will be only mildly affected. Iron under the skin, iron damaging the skin and stimulating the melanocytes are going to increase the production of melanin, so the skin will become abnormally colored, bronzed skin because of the iron itself and because of the increased me uh, melanin production. These people don't have neurologic alterations or other skin alterations, that, for example, the ones that we see around the mouth, etc., in other anemias. Hemosiderosis in the cardiac tissue may produce arrhythmia. Imagine all of these uh, myocytes, cardiac myocytes, conduction system of the heart, and all of these cells that have to work in perfect harmony. Now there is a lot of iron there, okay? So arrhythmias will occur. And if it is occurs in children, of course, growth and development issues are going to appear. And we are going to stop here, okay? Thalassemias is for next lecture. This is a bit complicated. So we need fresh minds in order to, to get these thalassemias.